Well, we're very pleased to have Gunita Mala here with us today, who's come to basically give us a talk about a, the, a new book that's just come out called 10,000 Memories. And many of you would already know about Gunita's work uh, through the, she's the founder of the 1947 Partition Archive. Uh, tonight, what we'd like to do is we've got this as a book launch, but also as a panel discussion. So we'd hope that this would open up the conversation as the archive itself has been doing with many of SOA students actually, in fact, having over the years been part of the, um, of the project in terms of the uh, collection gathering of oral uh, histories. I read those course as well. And Eleanor here taught a course on the partition. And I think even today there was a session that was kind of engaging with the archive itself as a resource material. So I think that it's, it's really wonderful for us to be able to have this event here today. So what, what I'd like to say is we're going to have as, as, a, as a kind of a talk, Anita's going to speak for about 20, 20, 25 minutes. And then we have some panelists as well, uh, Kamaldeep Sandhu. Um, and I'll maybe I'll introduce now who's a doctoral candidate at King's College in the War Studies Department, um, who is who works on security issues. Um, Dr. Eleanor Newbegin, um, who's a senior lecturer in modern South Asia and is also a co-investigator working with me on the border crossings project that's based here at SOAS. Um, and then finally, we have Aisha Sadika here, Dr. Aisha Sadika, who has been a research associate here at South Asia Institute, also at King's College in London and a number of other places as well, um, who has been a very foremost prominent commentator on political events. Um, by some military and security issues in the region as well. So we've got an array of different kinds of voices and perspectives, which aren't necessarily directly on the partition, but on the kind of legacies and aftermath. And I think the archive itself has been opening up that, the, the ways in which the new conversations that we're having. So Gunita, I'd like to just welcome you to, to begin your talk and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for taking time out of your evening. I'm just going to switch the slide up here while I talk to you. Um, so thank you also to the organizers for organizing this event today and to uh, my team members who helped organize Kamogi and Ashwani, Ishika, and yeah, you're, I can recognize it well just for a second. So we've got a bunch of team members. We've got uh, people who participated, whose families have participated in the project as well. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so in a way, our work is also a demonstration of how you can document a history across a communal divide. And we are launching this book today, um, or in, during this tour, I guess, 10,000 Memories is the name of the book. And I'm going to talk to you about basically the concept of our archive, which was in the previous slide. And I'm going to talk to you about our book and what's in it and how it could be potentially useful to you. Just a little acknowledgement for our funders. Um, we've had a little over 3,000 individuals who have donated anything from like one rupee, one dollar, one pound to um, a lot more. 15 family foundations have made this work possible. And hopefully once we surpass a certain number of book sales, they will also generate some sort of revenue. It's not gonna be the case in the beginning. Um, our biggest institutional funders are the National Endowment for the Humanities in the US. Uh, we worked very, very hard uh, to get them engaged. It took many years, a decade, over a decade. Uh, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And we feel that those are feathers in our cap um, uh, to be able to finally get those funders on board. So, um, you know, uh, we know sort of what happened at that time. It was the end of World War II. Uh, it was the end of the British Raj. We know that uh, Britain was undergoing post-World War II bankruptcy. If you were to ask me, I don't think the Allies or the Axis won. I feel that both sides kind of lost the war. Um, maybe the U.S. came out okay because it uh, really didn't experience the war as much on the homeland. Um, you know, and what happened in South Asia is that you pretty much had your entire governance structure kind of dissolved very, very quickly. And you ended up having mass chaos, land grab, property grab, and you know killing sprees. Um, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned for politicians today. Uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned on many, many levels from partition. Um, and I don't know, you know, this is 
something that I think is going to come out more in the future as more and more archives become accessible because there's a lot of stuff that's still uh, you know not accessible that's kind of blacked out um, in government archives. You know, there was also the situation of why did the British leave so quickly when there were voices within the British government saying we need 10 years to do this transition. Of course, there was a huge push um, in South Asia for the British to leave quickly. There were the Congress Party and the Muslim League pushing very, very hard for that. So there's that component. Um, there's also the American bailout. You know, there was a deadline. Uh, they did it in March 1948, the Bretton Woods Accord. Um, Britain got, you know, Britain was devastated. And um, there was a huge grant that came from the U.S. to help rebuild. And the U.S. was a huge voice in wanting the Britain out of India because they wanted to set up trade networks with the former colonies, which they couldn't do before. Uh, World War II was about these trade networks. And, you know, the colonies were, the, the British colonies were one trade network and so on. So I think you'll start to see more of the reasons in the future of why this happened so quickly and um, how it can be avoided in the future, a tragedy like this. So new maps were drawn very, very quickly, as we know, and the consequences were absolutely devastating. Uh, of course, I'm sure everybody here at SOAS knows these boundaries, but I just wanted to throw them up real quick. Uh, South Asia is looks like that. Um, this is India, the largest country in South Asia. And uh, no offense to people who uh, want to see the disputed parts of India as being shown as being in India, as you know, Within India, that's uh, a big thing, right? So, um, okay, so what did South Asia look like before partition? Here's a map pre partition. I'm sure many of you guys have already seen this. It's uh, you've got the pink areas, which are British India, you've got the green areas, which are um, kingdoms or the princely states that have an agreement, a military agreement essentially with the British. And what's really interesting is in the oral histories, it becomes really important that they're given their identities because people identify as being from their princely states or their kingdoms. They don't think of them as being princely states as part of British India. They think of them as being a country on its own. Like in Kashmir, for example, we've had a number of witnesses tell us very clearly that when you travel from Kashmir between uh, British India, that, you know, there are passport controls, there is immigration that you had to go through. So that's really interesting to know. Um, so it's it, it becomes important to keep this map in mind when doing our work with oral history. So it's really interesting how when you document stories from the ground up, even your maps start to look different. I'm sure all of you have seen this and I really don't need to go into it too much for this audience. This just kind of shows uh, you know, a lot of what happened, uh, a lot of the migrations and whatnot during partition. Now, right after August uh, 1947, this is what the map looked like. Remember that June 3rd is when uh, the partition plan was declared by Mountbatten. So that's really kind of the official date. It was August 17th when the lines were revealed, right, uh, publicly. August 13th is when they were finalized. August 17th is when they were revealed, the Radcliffe line. Um, yet, uh, this is what it looked like. You still had Hyderabad and Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir being independent. Uh, you had Pakistan on the green uh, on the left and uh, the east and west of Pakistan. And then you had India and then of course Burma separated at that point into an independent country. So this is the story of how a disappearing public memory was revived and documented through crowdsourcing by engaging both sides of a community divide. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, so, you know, I want to point out how in history, when people are writing histories, researching history, you know, in the past, the popular data sets have included government archives uh, because once they're, you know, they're created, they don't change once they're created. Uh, there's tangible heritage. There's newspaper archives. I want to point out that... Um, you know, even though it appears that government archives are static and that they must be unbiased because they're static, actually in the creation of them, there is bias. Somebody decides what's important to be archived. And of course, uh, governments have different metrics that they're measuring and every government is going to be different. 
And they're not necessarily a complete representation of the society at that time. And similarly, with newspapers we find in 47, um, you have newspapers that are aligned with their funders. You have newspapers that are funded by the Russians. You have newspapers that are you know, more aligned with the Congress party. You have other newspapers that are more aligned with the Muslim League. And there's like more than 200 and something publication. They're all ideologically aligned. And at this point, by the 1940s, these publications are, you know, there's a lot of venomous stuff going on, religious sentiment in the publications. Uh, it's actually very akin to what's happened in the last 10 years in social media with polarization in society. It was happening through these papers. But a very small segment of society was actually um, educated enough to read. And uh, so that was a segment of society that was getting polarized. But I wanted to point out that because of that reason, even the newspaper archives are not perfect. So you need to look at multiple, uh, for one event, you need to look at multiple newspapers to understand what was being said about it. And here we wanted to introduce a new data set, oral histories. You know, I, I think it is in the last 10 years gaining a lot of popularity, which is really great because you hear of new events, you hear of new perspectives um, and from oral history that you don't get from the other archives and it helps you build a more complete picture, a much more complete picture of what happened in the past because sentiment is a huge part. Um, and that's not the only thing that comes out of oral history. So why should we remember partition? Uh, we know that understanding the Holocaust gave us the UNHCR, gave us understandings of human rights. Uh, we can detect genocides hopefully intercept them before they happen. We can detect uh, dictatorships, hopefully, before they happen. Um, and from stories of Hiroshima, we got the nuclear non-proliferation movement. Hopefully, it is those stories that have possibly kept us alive and kept us from going into another nuclear war, which I don't think our world would be would have been able to sustain, and hopefully uh, we won't get into another one. Uh, and But, you know, from that same event of World War II, that same time period, we had partition happen. But the stories of this disaster, um, this Asian disaster, are missing from public discourse. It was the largest mass migration, at least the last century. It's a forgotten event. It was a dying memory when we started this work in 2009, 2010. And really sharing these stories, and I think by 2016, they were being shared on social media between 10 and 20 million times. Um, through our Facebook and whatnot, um, that has really helped transform, you know, public um, perception or public memory on partition. After that, I think around 2016, you also had that BBC documentary come out. We actually worked with them on that um, partition, my family and partition and me. Um, I think your mom's interview is in there, right? Yeah. And I think that those types of things that really helped kind of uh, bring out the public uh, or create public memory on uh, partition, create public interest. So there are critical lessons that remain unlearned from partition and leaving us vulnerable to repeating history. So yeah, we identified the problem and our solution of course was to crowdsource these oral histories. Um, some numbers around partition between 1946 and 1948, it's estimated that between 14 and 15 million people migrated. Uh, then Bazira Zamidar's research tells us that over the next 10 years, you had up to 25 million people or 1% of the world's population. So one in 100 people became, were displaced due to partition. Um, and then about 14% of the world or, or one in eight people were impacted if you think of all of South Asia being impacted. People migrated everywhere. That's what we find through our story. There wasn't any place that was spared. People migrated in and out of every place. Although you know, very heavily in uh, the northern parts of the subcontinent, Punjab, Bengal, um, Uttar Pradesh, that area today. Uh, but it did happen everywhere. So um, in 2011, we launched the 1947 Partition Archive officially and began documenting partition stories of an aging population as fast as possible, lest we forget. So to record the people's memories quickly and in a democratic way, we invented this concept of crowdsourcing. Well, we didn't invent the concept, but we used um, the technique of uh, this concept of crowdsourcing and applied it to oral history. Um, and this was 
really borrowed from the physics department at UC Berkeley. They were doing crowdsourcing experiments with some physics problems like protein folding. And what, um, our technique included training people every two weeks on how to document oral histories through a free workshop that is still taught every two weeks online. Any of you guys can log in, um, take that free workshop, even if you want to document something totally other than partition, you can still learn the techniques. Uh, the number here is incorrect. Uh, it should be 10,000, uh, 11,000 individuals have, sorry. Yeah, 11,000, uh, no, 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 sorry. This is, um, yeah, okay, so the number of individuals who've been trained, that's actually over 17,000 people have taken our workshop. And of them, uh, almost a thousand now are confirmed as citizen historians. That means they've documented an oral history. They've gone through the rigorous process, spent their 10 to 14 hours, and submitted that interview online. And it's been double checked by our team members. So stories are recorded all over the world by trained citizen historians and uploaded to our digital cloud. And it is a largely volunteer driven effort. Everybody is doing this out of passion. Uh, although now we finally have some funding for some of our internships to be paid internships, especially our digital archiving. So we had to create a lot of new processes uh, for the digital archiving work. And that has what, what has that's what's drawn the funding to this project for training the next generation of archivists, because there has been a lot of stuff that we've had to do from scratch. Um, we've of course created a new software, which we're hoping to open source once we get funding to do that uh, and put it out there for other projects to use as well. And, you know, it's um, a collection that has to be sensitive to a lot of different communal needs in South Asia. The handling of this collection has to be sensitive to that. Um, it has to be sensitive to all the different communities, different languages that are coming in, uh, the different types of titles that people use from all these you know, diverse areas. And that creates for some really unique uh, archiving challenges. And even like with the names of places changing with time. They're, you know, in South Asia, change, uh, place names are always changing. And so all of that, and then you have entire cities like Noah Kali, which literally just moved and then there was a flood. So all of those changes end up needing to be accounted for when we're doing this type of archiving work. So all communities are participating on the same platform with a sensitivity to communal feelings. So our first goal was to document 10,000 stories. And we have so far documented uh, more than 11,000 now at this point. So because of our first goal of documenting 10,000 stories, our book is named 10,000 Memories. And it's the first book in a series of books. Uh, we're, we're going to actually try to bring out abstracts of all the 10,000 stories. Um, so the book, obviously, it's got about 300 stories. It doesn't have 10,000, obviously. Uh, and they are, I'll talk about how they're organized in a minute, um, but they're basically abstracts from the complete video interviews, but we're going to put up all those interviews from the book so you can see the whole thing also on YouTube. But it's a really great way because you may not have, uh, you know, 300 hours, but you can, you can browse the book much quicker. So today, uh, more than 1,000 witnesses, okay, yeah, I'm going to forget about that, but there's 36 languages and now from 18 countries in the archive and over 75,000 photos and documents from, you know, that time period also archived. We're working with Stanford University to put up, so like I, I told you a minute ago that we're going to put up stories on YouTube, they're going to be edited for um, viewership, but we're going to put up the original uh, video interviews on Stanford's digital repositories. Anyone who wants to go stream those, see the actual like video files with all its bloopers and everything can go and see the original files um, there. But we're also actually working with universities in India and Pakistan. I'm just saying that because I get asked that. So there's the Lahore University of Management Sciences. Uh, there's the Habib University, uh, Guru Nanak Dev University in Amritsar. There's um, University of Delhi and Ashoka University. We're hoping to get Jadavpur in uh, Kolkata on board and hopefully in Bangladesh as well very soon. Uh, and there we've been able to offer research residency. So we've had students come in and uh, faculty come in and kind of just use the archive very openly 
and fascinating new findings have come out, which have blown me away as, as well. Uh, so yeah, this is just a little thing that we mapped Google Alerts and we saw how over time, the sharing of these stories on social media, um, how that changed the trend of uh, 1947 partition appearing on the web, across the web, and how it's just grown exponentially. Here's some uh, popular sort of, here's uh, popular uses of the archive. So two films you guys may have heard of, Pag Milka Pag and Bharat, two Bollywood films where they actually researched the archive. In fact, for Bharat, I even wonder, the story is just so similar to one of the stories we have in the archive that the film is based on. Um, I actually wonder if it's based on that film. Interestingly, we're not in their credits in the Indian version of the film. Maybe there's some issues with that, but we are in their international credits, like I saw us in the credits for the international version of Bharat. Uh, Virasati Khalsa Museum has an exhibit based on the archive. Um, then there's a Museum of the East in Bradford and the Canadian Museum of Human Rights um, in Ottawa that also has exhibits based on the archive. Uh, BBC film, as you guys are all familiar, my family partition and me, it's most well-known in the UK um, rather than other parts of the world. Uh, television documentaries that we worked on. There's another film that recently came out on Channel 4 in the UK where they've actually used footage from interviews in the archive. I think it's called Partition and Color. You guys have seen it? Okay. Um, a side effect of our work that a lot of people who lost family members, they get to, uh, they found each other through our social media postings. And now we run a group on Facebook for people to find their own home, old homes um, and do research on their families it's called Reconnect 1947. So if you guys want to plug into that, it's really interesting. Uh, so a philosophical point, uh, this moment right now is pretty complex. For example, most of you guys will not know what's happening in your backyard, what's happening outside on the street, what's happening in Tokyo. I'm sure you do know what's happening in Sudan, but uh, you know, it's every moment in history and time is really complex. Every moment before this moment is just as complex. Yet we have this tendency to reduce an entire person's lifetime into like a sentence, um, and an entire event into a paragraph or a book. Well, that's how we understand it. Our human brains are really, really limited. And I think we need to understand that because otherwise we have this tendency to get polarized. We don't look at the nuance. It's not our human tendency. And that polarization actually creates a lot of social unrest and it's really unproductive for society. And it's happening all over the world right now. And so I wanted to bring that up. And I think AI will help us realize that you, know, you can look at much more, but anyway. So how are we teaching the world? Uh, well, the first, what, what can we teach the world? I mentioned this earlier, you know, uh, I mentioned what we can learn from the Holocaust, what we did learn from the Holocaust in Hiroshima. And from memories of partition, we can understand communal violence. We can understand how that happens. We can understand what happens when a colonial entity just goes away really fast, uh, like the US and Iraq maybe, uh, or Afghanistan, what we saw, and you know the UK uh, and it's South Asian, it's, it's Indian colonies. Um, and I think we can teach inter-community empathy through storytelling. I think that's one of the biggest things that, uh, you know, being very general about it. There's of course a million things we can learn, uh, but just two really sort of big uh, takeaways. Inter-community empathy, I think, is more crucial than ever. We do have a very, very volatile border between India and Pakistan that's always on edge, right? And it's nuclear. We know that anything that happens there will affect the whole world. It's not going to be limited to that space there. Um, so there's about 27 PhD thesis projects that I know of, and probably many more that I don't know of, where they did oral history work. Uh, and submitted those histories to the archive that then ended up writing PhD theses on um, the work that they did. So, so how do we teach? Our first uh, you know, dissemination method is this book. There's a copy of it there, but that's a dummy copy and it's missing a lot of pages. I just wanna say that. So the book has two covers, the East cover and the West cover. Uh, it opens on both, so there's no, back of the book. Basically, uh, we didn't want any side to feel 
that it came first or that it was left out. So we gave both sides equal weight. And it starts out in Myanmar on the east. It starts out in Afghanistan on the left. And you meet in the middle at the Deccan Plateau. And this is not an interpretive work. It's not a critique. What you're getting is stories and very interesting highlighted excerpts. And we want you guys to make your own conclusions. We're an archive, so we're putting out, you know, what, uh, what's in the archive. I'm just gonna show you a couple of pages. And so, because very few pages are shown, I'm not trying to leave out any community or any region. It's just because of time constraints. So this is sort of how the book is set up. This particular story is from the Bengal chapter of the book. Um, what we've done is you'll see photographs, you'll see highlighted text. We had 30 curators work on this book so you don't get any one person's bias. And then you'll see anything, any interesting sort of historic uh, reference. There can be multiple, but we picked one and highlighted it. So for example, in his family, he talks about um, members of his family having joined the um, All India Forward Bloc, which was founded by Subhash Chandra Bose. And the Forward Bloc is not the same as the INA, which was also formed by Subhash Chandra Bose, the Indian National Army. So I'm just going to read you his quote. Under the cover of night, we would travel to distant villages to try to convince the populace about the adverse consequences of the imminent partition. On several occasions, we were embroiled in vicious confrontations uh, with armed mobs. Now, you'll see a lot of perspectives in the book. You'll actually see perspectives from people who were part of the armed mobs. And they'll talk about why they uh, committed you know, the violence that they did. And then you have people who were trying to stop the violence. Um, so you have all types of stories, and you can see all types of perspectives. This story is interesting. He was alive in the 1930s when you had the Indian, uh, the IRA, the Indian Revolutionary Army, which was modeled after the Irish Revolutionary Army. And I'm just going to read you some of his quotes. In 1930, at the age of 10, I carried out my first task of escorting three revolutionaries from Goripur to Ram Gopalpur. So uh, basically, he's talking about the famous Chittagong Armory Raid. I don't know if you guys have studied that, but it was in the 1930s. Uh, when that happened. And uh, yeah, so in fact, his family has uh, family history that's connected to uh, the Battle of Plassey, and that comes out in his family history, and it's, and it's very fascinating. So you get to read about that. You can see some of these individuals have family trees that go back hundreds, sometimes over a thousand years, and that's absolutely fascinating. This is Surya Sen on the left, and we've had somebody uh, actually from the Yad Vashem Museum who researches this, and it he researches how Irish literature traveled uh, via the United States, via the Gather Party based in San Francisco, over to India via, you know, uh, I think the Bay of Bengal or uh, Bombay, and you had communication between the two freedom movements. There was ideas being exchanged, and that's very fascinating. So these did not happen in a vacuum. Now, foreshadowing of the 1947 migration was the 1942 Great Migration out of Burma. Uh, so 1942, 1941 rather, you guys probably know that two days after Pearl Harbor, Burma was bombed by the Japanese, and it was part of the sort of Pacific ring of bombings. And uh, it led to a huge exodus of not only British personnel and British families, but Anglo-Indian families and all families of, you know, from different um, cities across British India who had settled there. Everybody who was not from Burma or ethnically Burmese uh, were seen as occupiers. So there was sort of a land grab movement of taking their land back. And you had this huge exodus out of Burma. It was very dangerous, huge columns of people moved out. And I think about half a million people were involved in that. A lot of people died along the way. You can hear some of those stories here. So he says the British soldiers who were leading our group would take everyone early in the morning and the rest of the day was spent walking through the wilderness. Some of the adults traveled on elephants. So in his case, and in many cases, uh, people who were 
um, you know, went through this migration in 42, went through another migration in 1947, and that happened to him. His father stayed back, so they migrated to Chittagong in uh, now Chattogram in uh, Bangladesh, now Bangladesh, then East Pakistan. And here's what he says. My father never migrated and had still been living in Chittagong, East Bengal. In order to attend our father's last rites, my young father and I pretended to be orange sellers on the train that ran from Shelda Station to Chittagong so that we would not be caught illegally trespassing the border. So you hear about people's unique struggles with families being split, with elders, especially in places that were not attacked in 1947, staying back and sending their kids to the other side because they, they were too attached to their land and to their homes to want to leave. Story of a freedom fighter. Uh, my sister, so in Assam, we see a very violent and strong uprising against uh, the British. You don't see the same level of violence in other places as you do here. Um, so here she says, my sister took the flag and marched forward with me. The British blocked us. And at one point they shot my sister, Kanaklata. seeing her dead, I fainted and I was brought home by some of my relatives. So this story is from Assam. Oh yeah, so I'm ending there. Um, if any of you guys want to get the pre-order of the book, it's not gonna arrive till June. Uh, you can use this coupon. Uh, I can also, we have a little app uh, we can use on our phones later. If any of you wanna do it, wanna tap your card, you can do that. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and open up the slides for, uh, we, right? yeah, why don't we have the three panelists come up to the front and then we'll I guess I'll pass this around, but just there's a lot of pages missing. Even the front pages are like uh, And the final cover has a uh, metallic uh, foil on it, not this one. So, um, so you're saying okay, so we'll take you one at a time. And I'll just, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tejwalti, for sharing this event and thanks to Shwas and Sunish and this. Uh, I'll not take long. I am here only to quickly share my experience as a citizen historian and tell you very briefly tell you my connection with the uh, archive. Um, I basically joined for a free lunch. And the story goes as, once a week, on Tottenham Court Road, there's a temple, Krishna temple, for the midst of that. So I was there, um, mesmerized by the uh, by the stories being told by the devotees there. And one of the person who was singing said that 20 years ago, as a young teenager, he was wasting his time on, on um, Tottenham Court Road on Oxford Street, and he saw, walk past the temple, and he said they were serving free lunch. And he thought to himself that there is some catch. I mean, there can't be free lunch, right? And he said, I was curious. So he said, anyway, I walked in. I had that free lunch. I saw what was going on there. I sat there for a while. He said, 20 years later, I'm still here. So he said, there was no free lunch. So for my free lunch was that uh, I heard about the archive back in 2014. Uh, and I just wanted to record and store my grandmother's and my father's story uh, with the archive. My, both sides of the family had migrated during partition. Um, and I had grown up listening to the stories that most of us have in, who have been affected by the partition. And here was an opportunity to do it for free. So uh, the only way to do it quickly, to do it was become a citizen historian yourself, uh, which I did while I was here in London. And on my first trip to India, I called her story and archived it. Uh, to become, and, and I'm still here after seven, eight years, so that was my free lunch. <laughs> uh, to become a citizen historian, all you have to do is to put your hand up, write to the archive that you want to be a citizen historian. As Rita mentioned, there are workshops run every two weeks. It's a two-hour workshop, which pretty much tells you the etiquettes of uh, conducting an interview uh, about South Asian culture, if you're not familiar with it, and so on. And... <clears throat> Once you qualify, then within 30 days, you have to record a story and submit in order to fully qualify as a citizen historian. The archive will send you updates with the stories available in your area. People who have who want to report their family stories, they go and register. Uh, and based on that database, you will be patched up with one of the stories which is available. 
and then you'll be linked with the family who wants to record their uh, story. Uh, you, once you've done that, you make an initial call, do a pre-interview kind of thing, do your little bit of research, and then you set a time and date as to when you go and record, want to record and story, record the story. Overall, it's about eight to ten hours job, depending on the travel. Uh, if you if you're not going out of town or something like that, and on the day you go there, you take some paperwork. Camera stand. These days you can do it on phones. Very easy. Microphone. The sound quality has to be very important because uh, it's ultimately you're listening to to the stories at the end of the day. And then on the day you go there, have a little chat. Tell them what you you hear for hear about, and then record the stories. We have had instances where, like, the family has picked you up from the station, or they called you, and they tell you that you know my dad or my mom. They, she's very old. They don't really remember much. So I don't know uh, how it's going to go. And once you sat down there with the camera on and you told them that you want to hear about the fedora, about the partition, and you asked them what happened, uh, it has been a very, a very, very magical experience. The stories that come out after that. Uh, I think we as kids, you know, we have this uh, urge to listen to stories from people around us and we grow up doing that and as we grow up we lose that kind of uh, uh, that that sense of enjoying the stories i mean my friend here is a good storyteller he can have said with that uh storytelling is an art and story listening to those stories it sort of uh satisfy a lot of lot of emotionally it sort of resets something within us and once you sit down and listen to the story just let it flow without any interruption. Let them think, let them speak, let them pause uh, and, and broad their memories. Uh, they may not remember everything, but uh, from my experience, they have their, they, whatever has happened at that time, they say, I can see it in front of my eyes like a movie as it's happening in front of me again. Re uh, record the story properly, finish it, doesn't matter how long it takes. Come back home. You have to get one particular form signed. That's it's, it's for, for um, legal purposes. Uh, we get the permissions from the family as to you want to archive. Firstly, you're happy to archive the story. You're happy to us to for the story to be part of book if you publish it on YouTube and all that. So depending on the permissions, we treat the story accordingly. And then you come back home and upload the story on the archive website. And once you've done that, you've got a confirmation from the archive that it's done. And the family also gets a confirmation that story has been archived and it's stored with us. And uh, as and when you need it, it can be shared with you. So this is what the whole a day uh, looks like uh, as a citizen historian. We are always looking for volunteers. Uh, it's not only just for archiving. We've done some fundraising as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, before COVID, we came up with this concept. Um, a couple of citizen historians got together. Ashni here uh, was with me in London at that time. We came up that choose a story that is very close to you. For me, for example, my grandmother. And she had traveled 200 kilometers. So I decided to run 200 kilometers in, in the same time period that she took to travel uh, over a month. Ashwin did some cycling based on his story that he had selected, and we did ran this campaign campaign globally, and we raised some funds uh, for the archive. Uh, we do a lot of events. You can volunteer for the events, and I mean, without the volunteers, it's a it's a people based organization, and without that, it's not possible. So my only advice is that if you can do it, and if you have any questions, please find me, and I'll be happy to answer that. Thank you. Um, well, thank you um, for inviting me and for, it's amazing to be part of, of this event and, and this book. So I'm based in the history department here at SOAS um, and have been working with my colleague Amrita Shodan on, on teaching histories of partition and my kind of contribution here comes from, from that perspective. And I think um, one of the things I wanted to flag was the way in which the book brings together memories and histories of the Second World War alongside memories and, and, and experiences of partition. And I think that bringing them together into the same time frame is actually really critical uh, for, for, for understanding um, this period. And that the events of 47 
can't really be understood or start to look very different if you dislodge them from the Second World War or think about them in isolation from them. And I'll talk about that in a little more in just a moment. But we, we start to get this idea about 1947 as being the kind of the, the product of age old enmity, that it's a long standing problem that comes through. Um, but that argument becomes much harder to sustain if we start with the history of the Second World War. And I think the Second World War is crucial for understanding what happens in 47 on a number of different fronts. So firstly, in terms of the politics of liberation and, and independence. So thinking about what happens to Congress with the declaration of war in 1939, thinking about the position that Jinnah is put into in terms of this kind of um, one, once the British are really ruling without any semblance of representative government through that period. Uh, there's a pressure on, on a lot of different kind of political parties. The Communist Party is recognized and, and Congress is not. So the political situation created by the Second World War has been shaped by the decades before that, but is itself quite particular. I think we also see in the Second World War a real change in the nature of British colonialism. I mean, actually, benign neglect, often not so benign, is the way in which kind of colonialism is, is characterised. But in the Second World War, there was really massive intervention. There was food, grain seized, there was rationing, um, there was food exported from bits of, of India here too. So you have a much, much more authoritarian state which is then followed by this point of withdrawal at the end of the Second World War. But the nature of British colonialism becomes much more draconian in that period, uh, much more violent in many ways in itself. And then thirdly, I think the way in which the Second World War impacts social and lived experiences, particularly in Punjab and Bengal. And there, you know, we focus on Punjab and Bengal when we're talking about 1947 for all kinds of reasons. I mean, in terms of the mixed population, they're the, they're the, the the provinces that are divided themselves. But if you think about how the war affects those provinces, that also helps us to think about one of the questions that continues to animate kind of historical discussion around 1947, which is why was this partition so bloody and so violent? But if you start thinking about the bombing of Burma, if you think about the Bengal famine, if you think about the work of the INA, and in, in the, in, in the side of Bengal, if you think about the role of the Indian army in the Second World War in Punjab, the social experiences of that, but also the weaponry that that leaves too. I mean, that this is, you, you can't make sense of what's going on in 1947 without those um, kinds of stories. And yet, and I say this particularly given we're hosting, you're hosting the event here in London, I think those histories do get uncoupled very quickly. And I think particularly in Britain, they have been uncoupled. Um, in Britain, there's a very popular narrative about the Second World War, which is, you know, sort of plucky Britain versus these two superpowers, the story of victory, which we need to, you questioned at the beginning, but that's a story that's told that already prefigures Britain as a nation state rather than an imperial force. And I think there has been since, I'd say, 2017 in particular, there's been a growing push to ensure that partition is not just seen as a story or a history that's part of the subcontinent, but that is actually vital to the way that, that, that Britain thinks about its own history. But that campaign has involved pushing against a very strong amnesia about empire that is itself framed by the way that we talk about history, the dominant historical narrative. And so the book itself, I think, is powerful on a number of fronts here. And I really, you know, I really appreciate the way in which the book is designed to complicate dominant narratives, that we have 10,000 voices, that we have a book that has no beginning or no end or begins and ends in, in lots of sort of different ways. And I think um, that is a fantastically important and powerful task. There are a number of powerful dominant narratives that badly need to be questioned and upset. Uh, and, and I mean, I think there's maybe we can talk a bit more in, in the questions and answers about how pluralizing that works in that way, but also what other kinds of interventions are needed here to think about, you know, 
all voices are, you talk about the complexity of the moment and all voices need to be listened to, but are there some that have been silenced for longer and that we need to make a bit more space to hear, I think would be, be something I'd be interested in. And just to sort of wrap up, to connect back to that, one of the privileges of teaching uh, about partition here at SOAS has been the students who come and study here, many of whom know about the 1947 partition archive, who are interested in doing their own work involving, you know, this feels like a history that's kind of particularly connected to them. And the only thing I would say is the archive is wonderful, but it's great to hear about the experiences of undertaking the interviews too, which I think are often transformative practices for the people who do them. So Janaya are currently working on a project that is thinking about how 47 is being remembered at this current moment. And I think the question of what younger generations are making of this history, the different kinds of questions that are being asked, um, the question of what do we want this history to do now moving forward all feel like extremely pertinent questions. Um, and it would be great. To, I know that we have many citizen historians here. It'd be great to hear more thoughts and, and hopes and work that people are doing around that. So. Um, First of all, thank you so much for doing this book, especially this age of artificial intelligence and chat GPT, uh, you know, when people tend to forget. And it's important. It's an important history to remember, uh, not just because, the you know, what you've laid out, you've laid out it in much more complexity. I would say it at, at a very emotional, emotive uh, nature of it um, at, at that level. Um, I personally, I, I study national uh, security, I study conflict uh, in South Asia, and one of the important conflicts that has infested our lives across the border, continues uh, for 75 years, uh, is so deeply rooted in partition in 1947. Um, and these personal stories uh, are going to probably help us understand why the conflict continues. I mean, I personally understood it much more when I crossed over and, and I took my journey, a personal journey. I mean, 2006 was, uh, I went to India first time in 2002, but 2006, I went to Punjab where a mother's uh, family had migrated from. And it's when, when I started searching for where she used to live, and, and I found it very easily and started talking to people. You realize that how, um, you know, what an experience it would have been. I also learned um, firsthand then while doing my own interviews and my own search for my mother's history was that it's interesting how, how people would have reacted. And one of the reactions, uh, I mean, growing up uh, in Pakistan, uh, the, the, the state narrative or the state reaction was tell stories of their part of partition. Uh, people traveled uh, across border, people uh, were attacked, there, were, there was carne, there was death and destruction, killing. And that's a baggage which the state uh, on both sides of the, of the divide wants you to carry with you. Uh, and that is what has dominated our thinking of each other. Uh, but then there is also another reaction at a personal level, which in some cases has been anger, another complete silence. Uh, I mean, I remember growing up, uh, my mother would talk about her part of East Punjab, but she would never talk about the violence and the loot and plunder and, and killing. It was not until 2006 that I realized that her family had traveled all that distance in 1947. I mean, that came as a surprise to me when I, when I visited there. Um, and so there are many more stories which are, which are, which are there in the book. Uh, I think it's 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 a it's a very important experience for people who who uh, have volunteered to tell their stories. It's a personal catharsis 
for for many at that level. Uh, I, I haven't I haven't kind of uh, had a chance to look into the book, but I'm sure there are many stories. I mean, there are people who were personally involved in violence. There are people who were affected by violence, and I'd imagine that these getting these stories together is going to teach us about our behaviors, our attitudes, uh, and learn, help us learn to deal with that history. Um, it would probably help us attain that maturity uh, in kind of staring that experience in the face and see, you know, what has emerged out of it. What can can we learn out of it? Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, one one of the last points I want to make is that um, while going to school and learning about you know what was taught the state narrative on partition, the uh, my actual physical contact with partition was when my uh, my father's sister, I mean, my my uh, my family is from uh, my father's family is from South Punjab, so. My father's sister once, you know, began to talk about how the Hindus and Sikhs uh, living there, I mean, how they experienced violence and how they were treated. And that was the first time I, as a Pakistani, as a Pakistani young person, then realized that there was something far more complex in, uh, in the partition story that we are being taught. There was something much more, much deeper that was happening on both sides. It wasn't, you can't find, you can't hold one as a culprit and another as, you know, as, as, as a perpetrator of violence and another as victim. There are victims on both sides and perpetrators of violence on both sides. And I think getting these stories out there and using them uh, is also a manner of confronting our realities jointly and say, we did it to ourselves, we did it to each other. Uh, now, is it possible to learn from it and actually make it, turn it into a building block, uh, you know, of our regional relations, um, bilateral relations, um, even individual relations? Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, what I'd like to, I know we're running a little bit late, but I think we have the room booked a little bit longer. So we'll probably carry on for another 10 to 15 minutes, maybe a little more. So if there are any questions or comments from people, yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you so much. I found that very fascinating. Not simple question, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask just one to me. I was interested to know how you've dealt with language because. Um, interviewing and, and speaking to people. Um, the, 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 the sort of freedom that one finds in speaking the tongue that they're most sort of intimately familiar with. So I was interested how the archive manages language and translation and the issues that that throws up. Yeah, so we want people to conduct interviews in their native language because of the connection uh, and because of someone's comfort in being able to express themselves. And we, try to be, you know, we try to push that really hard uh, as much as we can. It also empowers people in communities, especially that haven't been represented very well. It empowers the younger generation and empowers the elders as well. Um, and in terms of translations, um, yeah, you're gonna have loss in translation. There's nothing that I think we can do about that. There are concepts in certain languages that simply don't translate very well. I just can ask, was there any languages? Because sometimes Urdu or Punjabi, or, or there are certain dominant languages within the subcontinent that really sort of, uh, were there any languages that, or, or people that you found quite interesting and, and found it hard to match? Because I imagine that the citizen historians yeah. are being matched with, right, yeah. right on, on a linguistic basis as well. Were there any sort of lesser well-known languages, if you will. Yeah, that happens. And then we work with the person to find younger people in their language group who can interview them. Like, uh, I think I haven't shown this video of this talk, but in the more public talks, I show this video of one of our team members, Zabir Torvali, and he speaks a language that's only spoken by 3,000 people in the, uh, in the Swat region. 
And uh, so, yeah, so he's one of the only people that, you know, does the interviews in that area. And there's very few elders, of course, who remember that time period. Uh, so that does happen. And then that's our uh, technique. And we've actually had people like very recently, someone was doing um, interviews in Nagaland or wanted to, wanted to travel and then get a translator. We highly discouraged it. And we said, why don't we train someone local to do the interviews instead of this whole thing with a translator, because there's a lot of information. The connection is lost because that connection between the oral historian and the person telling their story is really important in the story coming out. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, here. Um, I just want to say thank you again. I found this really interesting as a student and being a book kind of studying composition. And I wanted to know how you dealt with competing differences. So, like talking to people and interviewing them and kind of being sensitive around that topic. Yeah, so communal differences are huge. And what we do is when we're matching citizen historians with interviewers, sorry, interviewees. Uh, we ask the interviewee their preference. Do they prefer somebody with a certain religious background? And many of them do, because they do have views, and we honor that. So we honor everybody's views because we know partition was a devastating event, and it will shape people's views, and that is fine. And they are going to be different than the views we have ourselves. Um, so yeah. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Listening to all this, I, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I wish we had sort of had uh, this opportunity of talking to our parents because we've all listened to stories from our parents and I too tried to record it. My, my, my parents that what we very successful, some of it was lost and so on. <clears throat> but what struck me at, at another talk that I attended on, on Sunday was this concept of intergenerational mm -hmm. trauma. Yeah. And I think our generation is actually living through all of that, this, this huge event that took place in world history. And I've been fortunate to sort of have lived in, in, in the three continents as a child. I was in Africa. And then in my teenage years, I was in India. And then uh, late part of my teenage years, I, I came here and experienced the racism that actually maybe was a byproduct of all those values that, that traveled. And um, it's probably, like you say, history doesn't stop at any one point. And so maybe this history should, should carry on. And perhaps we should have more oral histories of the people who have the second generation or the generation after that, but that have experienced all that other type of uh, racism and, and the trauma coming from that, because I've got a few personal stories about that as well. But obviously, this is more important as time time is of importance. But perhaps that's something that we should think of, about doing further. Yeah, actually, we kind of already do. So we don't advertise it. But if people want to submit stories uh, that they remember that they've been told, we're taking them in writing at the moment. Uh, because we are, our resources are so limited, which I hope will change, uh, we've been hyper-focusing them on the documentation of actual witnesses. Uh, but when people have stories and they really want to have them preserved, we have them submit them by writing. And we're taking them by writing. Eventually, we'll do audio and video as well. Uh, but it's it's a, just a matter of resources. But I think you were there at the Cindy Community House event. So good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. But, but I wanted to mention, um, Shiley Jean has done work on generational trauma in uh, partition witnesses. But she, yeah, I think she says you. it takes nine generations or something. She's a psychiatrist at Stanford. Yeah, I'll take the details. Thank you. I, uh, thank you so much, Kavita, and many congratulations for this wonderful collections. I've been also remotely, indirectly connected with the archives from Delhi since 2015. Um, my question, it's rather uh, inquisitiveness because I also work with material and memory uh, culture is uh, because uh, being migrant myself here in the UK, so I got both the stories, stories from the subcontinent and the diaspora here. So it's more philosophical, I would rather say. So, and since you have had now more than 
11,000 stories. And it's, uh, I, I come from the space of intergenerational memories and of course, building on his comment. Uh, do you feel there is a difference between the reconciliation process or the empathy process that's right now happening on subcontinent and you know internally displaced communities with uh, within the subcontinent and the difference with the diaspora you know across the world whether that's uk or us or africa so do you think there's a difference between a gap rather in that undergoing the process of reconciliation or empathy i think i think so and i think probably others here uh, you guys can probably answer this too i i feel so definitely because uh, you know, India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, they have got these uh, walls between them. It's very difficult to penetrate those borders. But when you're in the diaspora, there are no borders and you can intermingle uh, with other communities uh, and eventually realize that people are not as scary as the rumors you may have heard growing up and that everybody is just human. So yeah, I think there's a huge difference. In India and Pakistan, maybe Bangladesh not as much, but they're still very, very polarized. Bangladesh, yeah, I think they had the bigger trauma between Bangladesh and Pakistan in more recent memory. But um, in terms of that, you know, I don't think India and Bangladesh have as big of an animosity as um, maybe India and Pakistan do. And that's huge. I mean, if, if you're in Punjab, it's, not so much, but as you start to travel towards Delhi in India, I feel like it gets very strong. And um, as you get further away in the south, where there's no connection, it gets even stronger. Yes, can I just add one thing? Sorry. You know, my own experience was that, in fact, the generation or uh, which was, which had kind of seen, experienced, suffered, whatever term you may use, partition. Uh, I thought when, when I visited India and, and started to kind of talk or travel around and talk to people, I found that they were upset and angry. I mean, leaving, surrendering your home is not uh, the best experience to have. Uh, it's very painful. Yet, it didn't naturally make them an enemy of the other side Absolutely. because you were invested. It, that place had been your home once. It's the distance from that experience which then produced more anger, uh, more anxiety, and more hatred. Thank you so just the thoughts. I think that has to do also maybe potentially with memory. Like uh, the people who lived through it also lived through a more cosmopolitan past. They have the more positive memories of interacting between communities, the mundane. And then that one event has that very strong memory. Um, and I have not experienced hatred amongst people who went through the partition in the interviews that I did. At least. Yeah. Uh, and then you see the next generation, their children and their grandchildren are way more polarized. They're only hearing selective stories of violence, which seem to get, you know, passed exactly. on more. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Take maybe one or two more questions. So two here. So first you. Yeah. Hi, Vinita. Um, nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from my mum, who was one of the people that was interviewed. She's very sorry she couldn't be here today. She, maybe she might get emotional. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to ask a question. She said, uh, did you find a difference when you were interviewing men and women? Because mm -hmm. she was saying that from her memory, women bore the brunt of the violence uh, during partition and also the shame. A lot of them, and we found out after after what you've been doing all this amazing work that my mom's Marcy uh, had been abducted and subjected to well, you can imagine, and it was never spoken of. And she was ninety eight. That's the first time she's talking about. It. That's thanks to the work that you're doing. Your mom's you, Marcy is talking about. My mom's Marcy. Marcy yeah. We need to interview her. <laughs> So did you find a difference in yeah. men and women and what women are now after you know, so much time is passed, willing to talk about things that happen? Yeah, I'll also um, let maybe some of even uh, Shrini talk about this since you guys have also done a lot of interviews. Um, but yeah, I think there is definitely a difference, but there's differences in many ways. I also found that um, a lot of women who had, when they do start talking, they're actually um, 
more resolved with the trauma than some of the men that I've interviewed because the women have talked about it a lot more than other women over the years. And some men have not talked about it at all with anybody. And they have a harder time uh, articulating it. And there's much more emotion. But I've actually interviewed women who've talked very openly about a lot of trauma, like very easily. So, uh, you know, when I talk to them about why that may have been, and they've said it's because you know, they've talked about it so much over time with their with other women in their circles. Like socially, they've talked about it so much. Uh, but in terms of interviewing, women are less likely to want to be interviewed because uh, they're afraid that the male members of the family may not let them. So all of that does happen. So I don't know. Um, do you guys have any experiences that are different? Or Oh, I personally haven't had a few women, but I think in terms of the emotion itself, so that comes up quite. I mean, most of the interviews I did, most of the um, people have ended up crying during the interview. And uh, so I think it's not always the, the partition itself, where there could be moments within their journey has triggered. For example, I interviewed a 19 year old Pakistani gentleman who lives here, and he passed away now. And he, he fought World War II in the British Punjab Army. And for him, the moment when, you know, when they were in Germany and their battalion was killed by the German army, that was the moment which triggered him to cry. So there could be like the stories within the stories and, you know, necessarily, not necessarily all the people itself. So what was their journey? Because we didn't get the police state from the child that we were there. So there could be various so emotions could be triggered from different events um, of the journey. Thank you once again for being my wife's story. Uh, she cannot do her. May turn into more of a comment as some of these questions got answered that I had. But um, so I have been documenting this for my father who had to leave his house in Lahore and leave and move to Delhi and pretty much walk to Delhi. And he has a lot of memories of this. And it's every time he would talk about it, he would go from being very upset, leaving his house, leaving with everyone while his father had died a war that was not his and died in the war as a doctor. And then to the point that he would come back and talk about this little pet he missed in his house in Lahore. That's whom he wanted to go. And I think that was his safe place where he would go to. He would think of that. And so... I'm glad to know that we can actually bring up some of this and present it from our angle, like even though you may not want to talk about it, yeah. But what comes across uh, from someone who then blamed the British for everything and became a doctor in England, worked there for 20 years, and then moved back to India. And I've grown up in India and then lived for 20 years in Canada, and now I'm living here. Like, I've gone back and forth between so many different attitudes. How did you find the attitude of not racism, but bad stereotype that got set at that time. The people still with emotions and they have trauma still. Did that come out in the book? Did I just wait to read about it? Or did we have to censor it out at some point? Yeah, we haven't really censored anything. So the book is based on the summaries of interviews that are written by the interviewer. Um, but in terms of um, attitudes, I mean, I'm just going to tell you what I've seen. And again, there will be different interpretations. Uh, maybe, again, you guys can have, you know, maybe you have a different interpretation. I've seen that either it's children or the next generation who seem to be, have, who seem to have those negative attitudes for the other side. Adults, I haven't seen it yet in the interviews that I've come across. With adults who experienced that violence, um, they had lived through, I think, a time where they were more integrated with the other community. Okay, on rare occasions, I do see it in uh, interviews other people have conducted, uh, if they belong to, you know, extreme groups, groups with extreme points of views, political groups, then they had certain attitudes for sure. Um, but it's not very common amongst adults because they live these, I think, my, uh, in my view, more integrated societies, and they're able to separate partition from the rest and not have it be the defining moment. But for children and the next generation, I, it seems to become the defining moment. 
Um, I was going to ask you later, maybe, but also I thought it would be interesting for others. Um, we've been doing, as they said, um, the history of partition here, 2009, and we found the archives very, very useful. So thank you very much for that. And there are several dissertations that, I mean, they are undergraduate students that have used the publicly available uh, summaries that you have on your website. I wonder how we could feedback to the archives from, that, from those dissertations. Are you there way? And I can talk to you about it. Oh, sorry. Later, you but... wonder how we can do what feedback to the archive from oh, the dissertations yeah. that the students have written really... because they've been writing yeah. several dissertations. That'd be really neat. Undergrad. So how would maybe that's something on? we can talk about later? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But because I think there is very very interesting stuff in the archive, even just in the summaries and these yeah, are even just the summaries. Students. You're yeah. absolutely right. And um, yeah. Yeah, definitely there is. And just working on the book was kind of mind blowing for those of us who did it. There's about 30 of us. And all of us were, yeah, we were like, you know, up highs and lows of emotions all over the place. But it was really cool. Hopefully, uh, whoever reads it will have a similar experience. Well, I think what we have come to a close here. Thank you so much. I think there's so many interesting questions. And thank you for the.